What a delight to be here. And uh, uh, I've, I've never had to compete with the River Thames before, so I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about uh, about this uh, about this session. But I'm really thrilled to, to be here. This uh, uh, this this day is part of what uh, at least I have seen and, and Tom Lee uh, sees is a relationship, a journey uh, that we are on, hopefully with you uh, in the UK. Uh, about this whole question of how do we transform healthcare delivery and uh, achieve the objectives we all have of, uh, of, of providing terrific uh, services uh, to our patients. Uh, and, and this is a journey that uh, every country is on. Um, I, we haven't found a single country that isn't deeply concerned about the future of the healthcare system, about how to deal with the burgeoning cost, about how to deal with the tremendous needs uh, about how to do it better. Uh, so every country is on this journey, but here in the UK, uh, uh, you're at a, at a moment where I think the urgency of thinking a little bit differently about how things are done uh, is great. Uh, because, of course, there's a bill, uh, there's, a there's a lot of pressure on the budget. Um, and, and as I like to say, you know, when, when we have s strong financial constraints, as you have here in the UK, and as we do in the US, I mean, we have a number of choices. Uh, one thing we can do is we can just ration care. Uh, or we can cut costs in a way that reduce our quality. Or we can improve value. Or we can all take a pay cut, all of us in the field. So we've got some basic choices here. And, and the only way this is ever, the only way the math is going to work is we're going to have to do one of these things. So what, what do we want to do? And I think what, what clinicians, particularly around the world, but also everybody that cares about healthcare, the best solution is if we can actually substantially improve the value we're delivering. So what this uh, journey is about, and, and what I have been working on and with Tom Lee's partnership now over quite a number of years, about 10 years, is this question of how can we look at healthcare delivery using the lens of value for patients? And at one level, what I've just said seems trivial and obvious. Uh, but what I've come to understand is this is not quite the lens we've been using. We've been using a lot of lenses to think about healthcare, medical science, uh, you know, access, uh, compassionate care, good customer service. There's all kinds of lenses that people have been using to try to make things better. Uh, by and large, things have been getting better in important ways. But this lens of value uh, turns out, we believe, to be a very, very powerful lens. And it leads to a way of thinking about healthcare delivery and what to do uh, that what we have found is that it's very actionable. This is not a theory. This is not a, you know, an idea. This is something that actually is happening. And I can, I can tell you with, with great pride that it's happening in the UK. And this was already happening, but I think it's even happening uh, partly as a result of the journey that we've been on with you over the last year. Uh, in fact, we taught two UK case studies in our value-based healthcare delivery executive course uh, uh, this January. And Charlie Davey is the protagonist, as we call it, in one of those, one of those cases, about a tremendous change in thinking about how to deliver stroke care in London that is dramatically improving value. Uh, so uh, it's real. It's here. You're doing it. And, and the purpose of this session uh, today is to kind of uh, give you perhaps a little bit more holistic understanding of what this idea is all about, uh, I'll give you some examples of, of how to apply it in a variety of different contexts, uh, uh, this morning we're going to stay more at a more general level, but as we go into the afternoon, uh, we've been working and thinking about how we take the value uh, agenda and think about it in the context of mental uh, health care uh, and how mental health care and physical health care uh, can be seen uh, together in a way that will actually improve the value of both. So uh, what I'd like to do in this opening session is to kind of give you that uh, overall uh, framework for the value, for thinking about value, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, this will uh, kind of really start the day. And then Tom uh, uh, will talk a little bit about, you know, how it is that you actually put this into practice 
in, in real live delivery organizations. We're starting to see more of this going on around the world. And Charlie, of course, will talk about the marvelous work here in the UK, which is not the only uh, terrific work that we were aware of, but it, it's a great example, and we're so pleased that he is, he is here uh, with us. We're, uh, we're, we're proud of him and, and everything that has happened in, in the stroke area here. So uh, let's really start with kind of what's, what's this notion of value? What do we mean by value? And, and of course, we believe that this is the core issue in healthcare. Value is the outcomes we're able to achieve for our patients, your patients, uh, relative to the cost it takes to actually deliver those outcomes. That's value. Uh, value is the results we achieve in terms of patient health uh, relative to how much it costs us to actually deliver those results. And the premise here is that that equation, outcomes over cost, is the fundamental purpose of healthcare is to deliver excellent outcomes as efficiently as possible. Access to care matters, but we can't stop there. Uh, we've got to deliver value. Volume of service, being able to provide a lot of services on a timely basis is, matters, but we can't stop there. We've got to deliver a lot of value. Uh, you know, providing a good patient experience is important, but ultimately, we can't stop there. We've got to make sure that the results are good, that we deliver a lot of value, that we can do that as efficiently as possible. So value for us is true north in thinking about healthcare delivery. If every choice we make about what to do, about policies to set, is based on improving value for patients, we will get it right. That's kind of the fundamental premise of this work. And of course, the healthcare system uh, around the world that, that, we, that we've uh, studied, and, and we work not only in the U.S. by, I, I, by the way, let me start by saying I'm not going to, I'm not a marketing the U.S. system. I, I think the U.S. system is a mess. Uh, uh, but that is, there's good things going on in the U.S. But, but so don't, just because I'm American, don't think we're talking about the U.S. here as a, as a model. I've actually worked in Germany. I've worked in Sweden. I've worked in Denmark. I've worked in Japan. I've worked in Brazil. I've worked in many healthcare systems. And all healthcare systems are struggling to kind of align themselves with value because that's not the historical way uh, in which we thought about how to create and design a system. It's not been the lens that we've used. So the question we're going to talk about today is what do we mean by a value-based delivery system? What does value-based delivery look like? <coughs> what are its components? And then where are we on the journey? Where do we go next if we're going to be moving in that direction? So let, let's talk a little bit about that. Now, now before we get into the meat of the value, uh, uh, of the value framework, uh, we, we, we have to kind of recognize some kind of fundamentally important, uh, what we believe are truths. And that is that if we're going to maximize the value, we can't start by assuming that the way we're delivering care today uh, is uh, 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 ideal. Uh, uh, and that we can use that as the base for improvement. Uh, what we found is that the, the tendency in healthcare over the years has been to kind of take the basic structure of the system that's given, uh, the way a hospital looks, the way a GP practice looks, the way an outpatient practice looks, uh, the, way, the, the, way, the way we're organized today, the way, the way we have working together today. The tendency has been to kind of take that as a given and then try to overlay improvements to improve safety, uh, you know, care pathways, things like that. But what we've come to understand is that if we don't essentially address the fundamental structure, uh, those incremental improvements will not achieve the results that we, that we hope. I mean, uh, you know, a recent casualty is disease management. You know, we've all kind of understood that disease management is, is a good idea. Uh, we, we want to help people avoid the recurrence of disease and avoid uh, you know, relapses and, and, and complications and having to go to the hospital and so forth. Uh, but, and, and, and so it's, it's a great idea, but if we try to do disease management as an overlay to the kind of system as the way it operates uh, uh, currently in, in most countries, it, it turns out to help have only a little benefit. That said, if we could change the structure, if we could change the model uh, and the way we think about delivery, then we can in integrate disease management really into the care delivery process rather than view it as sort of a separate thing that we worry about on the side. 
Uh, so much of what's going on to try to improve health care has been these sort of things that we're doing on the side uh, to try to make things uh, better or more efficient or, or, or sort out our processes. But ultimately, what we've come to believe is that you have to change the structure. And that's going to be a little bit complicated and a little bit difficult. The structure we have today is a legacy of history. It has to do a lot with how physicians are trained and how they develop. It has a lot to do with the nature of medical uh, technology 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, when we had fewer technologies available, when a lot of care took place in the hospital, uh, where a neurologist or another specialist could really handle pretty much all diseases within their field because there wasn't all that much known compared to what there is today. Uh, where people, uh, where transportation was, was complicated, where, where people getting from, uh, wanted to, to be at a nearby hospital because they were going to be there for 20 days and their family wanted to visit them every day. Uh, but we don't have that system anymore. We don't have that world anymore. We have a world of, 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 of outpatient-centered care. We have a world where there's an explosion of technology and a lot of complexity. Uh, nobody can master all that. So we've got to rethink how we're organized uh, to provide care and, uh, and, and how we're measuring uh, what we do. And, and that's what the value uh, framework is all about. Now, I'm going to probably, uh, I should have cut this slide. Because this slide is going to talk about, well, is there a role for competition in a value-based system? And, and the answer is, uh, the first thing I need to tell you is what we mean by competition is choice. Choice, the patient having choice. Uh, and I think that what we found around the world is that the, the patient having choice about uh, where to go and, and who, who could provide them the best care is a good thing. Uh, is a good thing. Um, and, and, and therefore, at some level, uh, competing uh, to do a good job so you can attract patients uh, uh, to, 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 your, to, your, uh, to your care uh, is, is a good thing in stimulating improvement. Uh, rather than a situation where you essentially have a, uh, you know, patients are stuck with you. Uh, they, they have to come to you. Uh, so to that sense, we think that competition is good. The trouble with uh, competition in healthcare is that so much of it has been destructive. It hasn't created value for the patient. Because uh, competition has tended to take the form of, of, of shifting costs from one party to another, or trying to negotiate higher rates, or trying to beat down the rates. Or, uh, and, and, and of course, in the UK, you have this issue of private versus public uh, uh, care. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, there's a lot of issues surrounding the whole debate about competition, but for purposes of today's discussion, let's just think of competition, the useful part of competition, as actually having choice uh, and, and, and helping the patient get to the right uh, provider for their particular problem, given that provider's capabilities to serve them well. Uh, and, and there, I think, uh, well, Tom and I would believe that competition is a good thing. Uh, so let's, let's focus on that kind of competition and put all those other issues uh, that we debate so often on the side. I, I've said many times, I don't have any concern with whether it's a public system or a private system. Uh, I don't really care if it's for-profit or non-profit. That's not the key question. The key question is whether the organization delivers value. Uh, measurable, <coughs> demonstrable value for the patient. And I've seen publicly owned facilities deliver great value, and I've seen privately owned facilities uh, develop great value, and I've seen all those nonprofits that we have in America, uh, you know, deliver great value. But I've also seen all of those entities deliver bad value, poor value. <coughs> so let's not get hung up on those issues. Let, let again, true north in healthcare delivery is value for patients. Let's focus on that, and then we can kind of ask ourselves what institutional uh, structures and arrangements will both facilitate that. Now let, let's dive into the value, uh, uh, the value framework. What do we mean by value? Well, I've already told you once the kind of basic equation. Uh, uh, outcomes? Outcomes that matter to patients. Outcomes that matter to patients. Uh, that's the numerator. And the denominator is the cost of delivering those outcomes. Now let's talk about that equation a little bit because 
uh, it, it actually is, it, it takes a little bit of time to kind of get over some of the, the thinking that we, we often see uh, uh, in the field. The outcomes uh, that matter to patients can only really be measured around patients' medical conditions. The outcome for a hospital is kind of meaningless. So what if we measure the infection rate of the hospital? What does that really mean? It doesn't mean much. What you really want to know is the infection rate for, for, for you know, doing uh, you know, GI type uh, surger, surgical procedures to serve a, a particular set of diseases. Uh, the, the, uh, so we've got to measure outcomes really for the patient and for the patient's problem. How well did we do in dealing with this kind of problem uh, that, that a particular patient had? So that's kind of one, one key idea in terms of outcomes. Um, so many outcomes in healthcare today are, are really measured at the wrong level. They're not really measured for patients and their problems. They're really measured for, for departments or, 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 or entities. Uh, and therefore, we're not getting the information we need to decide whether we're really delivering value. We know that outcomes are multidimensional. For every conceivable medical, medical problem I've ever looked at, uh, there are more than one outcome that matters to patients. Uh, we often try to measure survival or mortality. That's good. That's an important thing to measure. But it's not the only thing. We need to understand whether the patient achieved good functional status, whether they could go back to work, uh, you know, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and we also need to measure how long it took us uh, to actually address the, the patient's problem. Uh, and if we can do it relatively quickly, that's a good outcome. If it takes us years and years, then that's not so good for the patient. Uh, and we're worried about recurrence of, of our problems. That's an outcome, too. Uh, so, so outcomes are inherently multidimensional. And we learn how, need to learn how to measure the whole set of outcomes that are relevant to a particular medical problem or medical condition. And we'll talk about that phrase, medical condition, a lot. Okay? That's the numerator. You can't, you can't collapse outcomes to one number. You know, quality adjusted life years is certainly a nice, you know, calculation to do, but it doesn't guide value creation. It may be a way of rationing or deciding, you know, which treatment is, is you know, advances life years the most, but it doesn't guide clinical practitioners in actually making the critical choices they need to, to, to make that whole set of outcomes better. So, uh, so when we talk about outcome measurement, we're not going to be talking about trying to come up with one measure of outcome, one way of collapsing all the relevant things into one number. That, that's not necessary. That's not helpful, actually, for, for driving value. Uh, uh, we're going to be talking about kind of understanding those set of outcomes that matter. The denominator of the value equation is cost. Uh, and what, what, what cost do we care about? Well, first of all, we care about the total cost of, of achieving the outcomes for the patient's problem. We don't care so much about the in individual cost of the individual services or the individual visits. Uh, a mistake that's made over and over again in healthcare is we try to beat down the cost of the individual services rather than think about the total cost of all the services that will be required uh, to deliver that excellent outcome. It's that total cost that matters. And as we'll see later, most healthcare delivery organizations actually don't know how to measure the relevant cost, which is the cost for a patient of going through the care cycle for their problem. Uh, we can measure the cost of the hospital, we can measure the cost of the pathology lab, we can measure the cost of the you know, ORs, uh, but we can't you know, measure the cost of Mrs. Jones' is breast cancer and, and dealing with that breast cancer over that whole cycle of care for that breast cancer. We don't know how to measure that usually. To the extent that we measure it, we usually do it wrong. Well. <coughs> so everybody in healthcare delivery really needs to become a cost accountant. That, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about cost accounting because you have to have an intuitive sense for how to think about what is really the cost of care. Uh, and we've got to learn how then to, to compare the cost of, 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 of caring for Mrs. Jones with the outcomes we achieve. Uh, and it's with those two pieces of information, we will change everything about the discussion we've been having in healthcare. 
uh, we'll finally be able to work collaboratively on the same page to try to make things better. Because we're going to want to reduce the costs that don't connect to the outcomes, that don't erode the outcomes. Uh, and we're going to want to uh, expend the costs and actually uh, make the outcomes better. Uh, that leads to kind of the second really critical principle in the value framework. And that is, if we're going to try to drive value, uh, we have, of course, the numerator and the denominator. So much of the attention in healthcare has been on the denominator. You know, how do we contain costs? You know, how much time do all of you spend, you know, fiddling with that issue, you know? And, and we're doing it all over the world. And, and uh, uh, but it turns out that that's, that's kind of, cost containment is not the right goal. <laughs> cost containment is a dumb goal. The right goal is value improvement. <coughs> and guess what? The most powerful way to improve value and to contain cost is actually to improve the outcomes. It's the new rate that's our big level to actually improve value. Because if we can make outcomes better, if we can get things done more quickly, if we can get a, a, a good, a complete recovery, if we can get the patient functional, if we can avoid, you know, uh, 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 complications, if we can get the diagnosis right, uh, if we can execute the treatment uh, with great skill, uh, if we do all those things that, that improve the outcome, that's how cost actually goes down. Because, of course, the way to reduce the cost of health care is to, is to improve health, not do more stuff. Okay? So, so the value equation really, I think, puts the highlight on that outcome improvement is your friend if what you want to do is try to contain costs, not the enemy. There's so much uh, intuition in the field. People think, oh, this new technology, you know, is so expensive and we, we can't... We can't, we can't use it, you know, excellent care is expensive. No, 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 no. <coughs> excellent care is the lowest cost. We find that over and over and over again. Uh, and, uh, and we've got to harness that power. And of course, how do we harness that power? We've got to measure the outcomes. We've got to measure properly the outcomes, uh, really for every, uh, every, all the care that we're, that we're giving. And that's something that nobody's doing anywhere in the world yet. Uh, some countries are farther along, Sweden perhaps is the single most advanced country in outcome measurement, uh, but we all have a long way to go, and, and there's a long way to go here uh, if, if in the UK. Now, then the question is, how do we deliver the maximum value? How do we keep improving that value over time? Well, here, um, the, we've kind of, uh, the way we think about it is that there, there's kind of six fundamental agendas. Every delivery organization has these six agendas uh, uh, to uh, uh, significantly improve the value of the solution. Um, and every one of you, whatever you're doing, whatever kind of organization, GP, you know, acute care, you know, cancer care, mental health care, every one of you has these six agendas. Uh, we've got to, we, this is, the, this, these, are, these are the paths that we have to be on. So let's talk about those agendas a little bit. Agenda number one, uh, I really already hinted at, we've got to reorganize our care teams. We've got to reorganize how we think about the delivery unit. Okay? Uh, and, 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 and we can, there's some ideas there for, that we can, uh, that's sort of most obvious for specialty care, so if we're caring for a diabetic or a head and neck cancer patient, or uh, an, an orthopedic patient who has severe arthritis, uh, arthritis and needs a hip replacement, uh, we can think about it for that kind of care, but we can also think about it for primary preventative care, and, and we'll talk about both. We have to reorganize our care delivery model. We have to get people working together in different kinds of structures in different ways. Okay, that's step number one of the value agenda. We'll talk about that. Number two, we have to measure. We have to measure outcomes for the condition or the problem that we're trying to address. Uh, uh, we got to measure those uh, systematically and rigorously, uh, and we have to measure the cost. And, and we have to learn how to do that pretty much for every patient. Right now, uh, you know, we do costing studies after the fact. We do 
clinical studies to try to figure out whether the outcomes are good. Uh, it's kind of retrospective. Uh, but what we have to learn how to do is make outcome and cost measurement really part of daily life. The best providers today are measuring outcomes in the line of care. They're, 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 they're tracking those outcomes continuously. They're having patients do tablet, do tablet uh, questionnaires uh, when they show up for their visit. And they're feeding in what they found out from that score or whatever uh, data they gathered uh, in the clinical uh, encounter. Uh, we're, we're seeing more and more of that. And, and the technology is allowing us to do that better and better. Uh, uh, so we have to measure. You can't improve what you don't measure. You, have, you can have opinions about improvement if you don't measure it, uh, but you can't really improve or you can't really systematically improve unless you measure. And this, we have, we have been crippled in healthcare by the lack of measure of what really matters. Our central purpose, uh, we've got to measure, and we'll talk about how to do that later. We've got to change the way we think about paying for care. We can't pay anymore, we can't think about paying anymore for doing stuff. We can't pay for individual services. That can't work. It can only confuse us, it can only distract us uh, from uh, the innovation that we all need to make. We have to learn how to pay for the whole package of services in order to deal with the patient's problem. Over some, you know, significant chunk <coughs> from the care delivery process for that patient's problem. Uh, we call that a bundle of price. Uh, you know, we, we, we need to sell uh, cars, not carburetors. Uh, we, need to, we need to be paid to do a job, which is to uh, help address Mrs. Jones's breast cancer. Properly risk adjusted, of course, for how complicated her case is. Uh, and, and then we have to take those resources that we've been paid and use them the best way we can uh, to uh, do that care well. Rather than have to have six visits to get paid, or rather than they have to be this image to get paid, or rather than they have to provide any particular service. We don't want to lock ourselves into having to do anything. We want to figure out how to do it better. We want to be motivated uh, to eliminate <coughs> services that really we don't need. Uh, uh, because we are aligned uh, with the, need, the patient. The patient doesn't really care what you did. The patient really is there to get good outcomes. And, uh, and, and, and of course, our job is to, is to do that and, and do it efficiently and use our resources accordingly. So we've got to change the reimbursement model. And uh, uh, we can do that at kind of systemic levels, but we can also do it at levels within organizations. So when we're talking about how a hospital reimburses its, its, its teams, we can do the bundle reimbursement within with the hospital, even if the hospital is paid a you know a capitated amount. Uh, uh, so so we'll talk a little bit about that. Number four, we have to stop thinking of individual uh, uh, hospitals and clinics and practices as standalone organizations, each of which tries to do a little bit of everything. We've got to start thinking about how to integrate care across separate facilities. Uh, get the patient to the right facility uh, at the right time for the right service, as opposed to uh, think that we're going to provide all the services in, in any one organization uh, or in any one facility. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, we've got to get away from the idea that healthcare should be viewed as a kind of local business, where you serve your local community. This is very strongly, you know, kind of embedded in, in kind of the psyche, you know. Uh, in the UK, but it, it's everywhere. You know, there's a local hospital and it serves the people, you know, living within some uh, distance from that, from that hospital. And, and then there's another hospital that's, you know, over here and the, the, that serves the people that are, that are kind of, you know, most uh, closely uh, 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 related to it in terms of physical location. Um, and those are two separate organizations and they do their own thing. You know, they kind of, they kind of decide how to, you know, how to, how to do their business. 
That model, uh, again, doesn't make any sense from a value perspective. Uh, uh, particularly in a world where, you know, where patients are not going to have to stay in the hospital for 20 days. Uh, and, and, and where mobility is substantially greater, uh, and where we, where, where we need complex tertiary facilities for some services, but we don't need them for others. Uh, so we've got to think about uh, how to get uh, organizations that are really great at certain services to not just serve their local community, but also actually manage care for that area across geography. And we're starting to see that happen in various parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about that later. And finally, we need to think about how to build the right kind of information technology platform. <coughs> what we'll see is that in order to really integrate care around the patient's problem, in order to really understand outcomes and costs, in order to uh, connect the dots across services and facilities, uh, having the right IT platform where everybody can get access to a common set of information about uh, that patient, uh, uh, they, can, they can view that information, where the patient can view that information. Uh, the IT platform really makes it easier. It's not a necessity. You can do a lot without having the perfect IT platform, uh, but to the extent that we have an excellent IT platform and we'll talk a little bit about what one looks like, uh, then uh, we're going to be in uh, advantage and, and speed it through this process. So the question is, you know, how is your organization doing in kind of moving through the value agenda? You know, where, do you, where do you stand? You know, ha have we started to think about how to really truly integrate our care around the patient? You know, have we started measuring and so on and so forth? Uh, that, that's kind of what I'd like you all to be thinking as, as, as you're listening here. H where are we in this journey? of transforming ourselves uh, to be a, a much more value-driven uh, organization. Now, let's start with the care model. <clears throat> In terms of the organization of care, uh, the idea is really very simple. But it's a little bit uh, complicated when we start thinking about you know, how to do it. The current organizational model for care in most of healthcare, everywhere in the world, organizes care around specialties, and services. So this, this chart here, this little bubble chart, is the typical care model. Uh, this example is actually for care for migraines and, and, and kind of uh, severe headaches. Uh, and it's an example from Germany. Um, and but Germany is not different here. Uh, most migraines are cared for the same way. Each of those yellow bubbles is either a specialty or a particular service an image, or, or, or whatever, okay? How is care delivered? Uh, care is delivered uh, as the patient kind of goes through a journey around and across and to those various bubbles, okay? Now, what's the nature of that care delivery process today? Number one, it's sequential. You go to one bubble, something happens to you, uh, you have to go to the next bubble, uh, the next bubble, the next bubble. It's a sequential process. Now, the kind of, of course, the opposite of that would be a parallel process, where you're kind of going through the whole thing at the same time. Sequential process. Each step in the process involves a separate administrative interaction. You have to, you know, talk to somebody, you know, make an appointment, you know, go to the waiting room, you know, fill out a clipboard. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and do your thing. And you do, you do it once, and then, then when it's time to go to the next bubble, you do it again, and again, and again. And each of those bubbles has a separate administrative structure. Somebody to call, somebody to make the appointment. The counterpoint to that would be, you just call one place, and they set it all up. Okay, that's, that's, that's the high value model. Um, the third thing about this process is that it requires <coughs> lots of coordination <coughs> because all of these bubbles are separate. These people, the people often don't even know each other. They're working in different spaces uh, and, and they're busy. You know, you, you guys work really hard. You know, and uh, you know, coordinating and sort of talking to people and figuring out, you know, what did you think? What did you think? What should we do? You know, people write notes to each other. 
you know, eventually. Uh, and they read them, you know, but, but, but the coordination is complicated in this system. And therefore, by and large, the coordinator of care, in many cases, is the patient, you know, the patient's family. They have to try to figure out what they've heard from all this and put it all together. A great GP can, can do this, but for the GP to do this, it's a lot of work. You know, because they got to deal with all these different actors doing their, doing their thing. The final thing about this care process that's, uh, I think, particularly uh, striking is this process is not designed today in most cases, uh, to get each of those bubbles to be the people who are the real experts on the patient's problem. Okay, so you go to a, a primary care physician, that primary care physician, you know, you have headaches, you have, you know, you have the aura, you know, and, and you know, you have all the classic symptoms, and you go to the primary care physician, physician and he or she does their best. You know, are they interested in migraine? Do they know much about headaches? You know, well, maybe. You know, they could. Maybe not, though. Maybe they're not, that's not something they're interested in. Uh, you go to a neurologist. Is that neurologist uh, uh, really interested or knowledgeable or uh, in, in migraines, or, or are they more turned on by MS patients or dealing with stroke patients in, in terms of their recovery? Phase? I mean, you know, I, there, there was a time when anybody knew, knew everything that there was to know. About, about these conditions, but, 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 but now, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big <coughs> job for any of these bubbles to kind of be really good and really interested and really expert in everything. So uh, what I like to say is that, that this, the people that are, that are providing the care in this, in this process today uh, are, are what you might call, in using a sports analogy, a pickup team. It's kind of a pickup team. It's, you know, I, I used to play baseball when I was a kid, and, you know, on Saturday morning I would go down to the ball field with my bat and my glove and my ball and see who else was there. And depending on who was on the schedule and who showed up that morning, we would sort of pick up our team. And, and, and Tom would be the catcher and I would be the pitcher, you know, because that's kind of what we decided we were best equipped to do. That day, but but it's not a real team. A real team is a group of people that are knowledgeable and work together on a regular basis to deal with a you know to, to, to play a particular game or, or deal with a particular set of problems. And that's not the way we've structured the, the system today. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody here, almost everybody, 99.9% .9 of the people in healthcare delivery work really hard. It's not effort we're talking about. Uh, the people are well-trained, by and large, smart, elite, you know, highly selected people. So this is not about the people or how hard they work or how much they care. It's about the structure that we put people in and ask them to work in. And that's the problem in healthcare. That's the big problem. We've got the wrong structure. This model on the left, no matter how everybody works, how hard they work, can't deliver really high value. Can't deliver it really efficiently. It's just destined to be mediocre. Uh, except in those you know, hero cases where some genius kind of figures it out. What's the alternative? The alternative is we organize around the patient's need. In this case, the need is to deal with you know, severe headache the library. If we organize around the need, what we do is we put the team together that has the skills to deal with that problem or that set of problems. And this, you, this could be breast cancer. This could be, uh, again, you know, uh, so ortho orthopedic condition. It could be a neurological condition. It could be a pediatric condition. We organize around the condition of the patient, uh, recognizing that, that condition might have some complications. It might have some comorbidities. It might have some, uh, some things that, that tend to occur together. So we organize around those two, and we include those into our definition of who the team is. And we put that team together, and we let them work together in order to deliver care. <laughs> And that's what the German, uh, German uh, system did with this West German Headache Center model. Very simple. Very simple. 
But you know what happened? Outcomes were really quite lousy in the traditional system in Germany. A lot of migraine patients didn't have their disease controlled, uh, uh, but went back to the doctor over and over again, uh, showed up at the emergency room, missed days and days of work. Uh, 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 they changed from the, uh, the system on the left to the approach on the right. Outcomes immediately improved, hugely improved, epically improved. Because the people that were delivering the care, once you got past the PCP, if the PCP wasn't able to kind of handle it or uh, couldn't, couldn't quite figure out the best, the best uh, therapy, uh, then, then essentially the patient was passed to the center and the center put them through uh, a, a parallel process with a team and educated them about the set of things that they needed to do. And, and guess what? A lot of those patients started doing a lot better, very quickly. Now, what also happened, and you'll be amused to hear this, uh, I, I think, uh, you won't be surprised, the cost went up. Why? Because when you go through this sequential process, what you're doing is you're stretching out the cost. The cost of the first visit, you pay. Then time goes by, the patient goes home, they hope they're better, they're still having headaches, but they are kind of embarrassed to go back again so soon, so eventually they'll come back. Okay, then you have to pay the cost of, the, of that next thing. Uh, and then, et cetera, et cetera. What happened was this model, the West German Headache Center model, pulled those costs, some of those costs up front. Because you kind of went through all these services right, right up front. <laughs> so the costs went up. So think in your mind how long costs were higher. And, and the answer turns out in this case to be eight months. It only took eight months for the lines to cross. It only took eight months for the savings in terms of repeat visits and emergency rooms and so forth, for those, for those costs, the, those savings to actually overwhelm the little bit higher costs that we pulled up front in order to provide the team care all at once. Uh, and, and again, the patient loves this model. All they do is call somebody and, and say, you know, I've been referred by XYZ, I have severe headaches, and then the person they're talking on the phone, they know their problem. They know who they need to see. They set it up for one day. It's easy. It's a dream. <coughs> now, this is an example of how a simple organizational change has tremendous improvement in value. It's not a breakthrough in medical science. And this is our opportunity in healthcare. Sure, we can improve medical science. Sure, we can improve technology. But our big opportunity is structure, measurement, and organizing how we do our uh, uh, delivery method. And this, is, I think, is a, is a wonderful example of that. Uh, again, a medical condition, organizing around the patient means organizing around the patient's problem. A medical condition is a, a set of medical problems uh, that, are, that are related, that are, that are best addressed in an, in an integrated way with a multidisciplinary team uh, in, a, in a parallel process. That includes multiple specialties. Uh, it includes uh, uh, comorbidities that are, that are common or, or relatively uh, uh, frequent. Uh, uh, those are part of the medical condition and, and the team has to be equipped to deal with those things as part of the team, as opposed to a separate, uh, separate uh, 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 event. In primary and preventative care, we have a little bit of a different issue. Uh, but it's the same fundamental concept. Today, you know, most primary care, we believe, is mission impossible. We've got a primary care practice, one structure, that's trying to take care of patients with a huge range of needs, even for primary care. We've got one, one patient comes in that's basically a healthy adult, you know, needing their checkup, or they have a cold. And then the next patient comes in and has cancer. And the next patient that comes in has kind of severe diabetes. And the next patient has asthma. And we have one structure that's going to serve all those patients. 
Mission impossible. Can't deliver high value. Everybody works hard. It's not a matter of effort. It's not a matter of training. It's not a matter of skill. It's a matter that we're not organized the right way. And, and, and Tom and I believe uh, that the thing about primary care is that there are segments of patients. Any primary care process has segments of patients with similar needs for primary and preventative care. You know, healthy adult. Uh, a, uh, a, a patient with multiple, you know, significant chronic <coughs> conditions. Different kind of care model is appropriate for those. So, so a primary care practice shouldn't be monolithic. It shouldn't be one size fits all. It should be thinking about what are the clumps of patients we have, and then let's organize uh, teams and, and, and kind of manage those patients. And, uh, and we, we can talk about that as, as we go, and, and Tom will probably want to talk about that as well. Okay? Uh, as we think about organizing care, we have to understand that for any medical condition, there is a cycle of care that stretches over time, sometimes forever. And we've got to start thinking about that cycle as a whole rather than thinking about the individual slices of the cycle. And we've got to think about, you know, who should do what and where should it happen over this cycle. And, and again, this is thinking that uh, has not really, this, the power of looking at the whole cycle has not really been used in much of healthcare because nobody's responsible for it. Because we're not organized around the patient's problem, we're organized around using whatever tool that we have, or we're trained in, or our department does. And therefore, we give up all these very powerful opportunities. Okay, time is very short. We need, in order to deliver value, we need a certain amount of volume of patients with a given problem. We need some volume. Because if we have volume, we can have a dedicated team. We can have a team where we spend two days a week with, on this, this, these kind of patients, and three days a week on another kind of patient. If we have enough volume, we, we can have a team that spends five days a week on breast cancer, uh, or, or, or whatever the problem is. We need a certain amount of volume. If we have volume, we can measure better, we can utilize our capacity better, we can adjust our facilities in order to deliver the care more efficiently because we're in the right kind of space. We can work together in the right way with the right kind of equipment and, 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 uh, and, and on-site testing and so forth if we have some volume. So volume does matter. The problem is that the way the system is organized today, we've fragmented that volume into little bits because everybody is basically doing everything. Instead of uh, getting the patients to uh, a smaller number of places that actually have the volume and, and expertise to be really efficient at high value, we tend to, everybody tends to do a little bit of everything. This is some example of data from Sweden. As, as good as Sweden is at measuring, they've got this problem in state. Sweden has about 80 hospitals. Uh, and you can see uh, that you know a lot of those uh, a lot of those hospitals do everything. This is just a, an example of some conditions in some cases of procedures. Uh, and you can see that the, the key number, of course, is the one on the right. How many patients per week do you see with a particular problem? And you see the answer here in Sweden is one or two or three, and there's, there's exceptions to that. But if you're only doing one total knee replacement a week, or if you're only doing one, dealing with one, uh, uh, you know, multiple sclerosis patient uh, a week, uh, can you ever deliver value? Uh, no. You really can't. I mean, you, you can do okay, uh, but you, you can't possibly uh, have enough expertise and have enough of a team and have enough efficiency in order to do it right. So we have to conquer this problem of fragmentation. Fragmentation of service lines, fragmentation across entities in terms of uh, breadth of line. So this is just some more data from Germany which just makes the same point. Uh, and we all kind of understand that the medical literature is very clear on this point. That you need a certain amount of volume in order to really de deliver excellence, and, and so let's take advantage of that. 
this is some data on you know mortality and low birth weight uh, infants. And yeah, it's very compelling. And this study's been replicated in other countries. You know, if you're if you're a low birth weight kid, you'd much rather be in a higher higher volume facility that is used to seeing low birth weight kids. In fact, this German study showed that the mortality rate in the in the very low in the in the very premature was double. How, how many mothers would you know want to have their baby? in a place where they have double the mortality rate. There's a 30% chance they'll lose that baby. But yet every day, mothers make that decision. Because they go to the hospital close to home, and the hospital close to home thinks they're being heroic by providing those services and serving their community. All right. Okay. We have to get over that. We have to, the compass, true north, is value. Delivering excellent outcomes and doing it efficiently. We've got to start making decisions based on value, not on prestige, not on having a full product line. None of those things are relevant. <coughs> They're distractions. They, they've confused us. We have to focus on value. Now let's talk a little bit about measurement, and I'm significantly behind, so I'm going to go very quickly now. But I think I've given you kind of some of the essence of this idea, and Tom will bring it to in terms of measurement, uh, what we really want to measure is, as I said many times already, outcomes, results. Uh, of course, we should measure our processes. We should measure how we go about care. Because if we don't measure our processes, it, you know, we, we, we won't have the capacity to improve those processes because we won't know what we really do and how consistently we do what we do. Um, but what we've learned is that measuring processes is not the same as measuring results. And in fact, measuring processes it can be actually a trap. Uh, healthcare has sort of locked on to process measurement. Uh, you know, we're all measuring whether you know we as clinicians you know do the right thing in the right sequence. Uh, but the trouble is that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, processes don't actually connect necessarily with outcomes in every case. In every case, uh, what we know to be the best process changes a lot. There's a wonderful study that shows that the half life of a process guideline is five years or less. And then somebody has a better idea about you know how to deal with this and what sequence to do things. Process guidelines never cover the whole care cycle. Never cover all the choices we have to make. It's a real mistake then to try to control quality by uh, process compliance. What we have to do is we have to start measuring outcomes and see how the patient does. And then we can start asking ourselves, well, OK, did this process help? Did that process help? Uh, with, without that connection and without doing that religiously and relentlessly, you know, for patient after patient, we'll, 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 we'll lose real power in, in terms of improving value. Uh, in terms of measuring outcomes, we have a concept we call the outcomes hierarchy, which is sort of a framework for thinking about what are the outcomes that matter to the patient. And of course, uh, at the top, there's what we call tier one, which is the health status we achieve or the health status we retain in the case of a degenerative uh, condition. Uh, and, and that's pretty clear. Uh, mortality, but also functional status, uh, clinical status. Uh, we want to measure. Uh, we also want to measure, you know, how ugly and, and time-consuming was the process of recovery. You know, how many complications were there? How how much, uh, you know, side effects and discomfort and time uh, did the recovery take? We need to measure that. That's an outcome that matters to the patient. Uh, because if they're away from work for 30 days because they're going through some care process, that's that's a lot worse care in terms of results than than than, than, than if it took 10 days. And then this tier three is what we call sustainability. For any given medical condition, uh, we have to think about the specific outcomes that matter. And by the way, they're specific to every medical condition. You know, there may be certain individual me measures that we can apply to multiple medical conditions, but in general, we're going to have a tailored set of outcomes for breast cancer, and they're going to be different than the outcomes for head and neck cancer. And they're going to be different uh, than, obviously, the outcomes for uh, a diabetic. And so our teams, one of the key jobs of any clinical team is to figure out what are those outcomes of that. And then how can we start measuring them? And, and we can start out by writing them down on a piece of paper. 
We don't need a fancy IT system. We can just start tracking the best we can, and then over time, hopefully, we can do that more and more scientifically. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go by the fact that we have to adjust for risk. Well, we know how to do that. We know how to think about that. The fundamental purpose of outcome measurement is not to have scorecards in the newspaper. The fundamental purpose of outcome measurements is to help clinical teams do a better job. Uh, and we can, you know, we, can, we can wait to publish to the public until we're confident in the metrics, but we've got to do the metrics uh, even, if, even if they're not perfect. We have, we have to do it. Uh, uh, this data is data from the, uh, uh, one of the few areas in America where we religiously measure every outcome for every patient uh, in, with a medical condition. In this case, it's uh, kidney transplantation. Uh, it's really, you know, chronic, uh, you know, uh, kidney failure for which a transplant is available or potentially possible. Um, and uh, now, as part of our national learning system, every single center that does a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or any other kind of transplant has to measure outcomes. To get the organ, you have to get, measure the outcome. That's a pretty strong uh, pressure uh, to measure. Uh, this is the data, the first data set that was available uh, from this process. Uh, they, they tend to pr they publish three-year kind of clumps of, of data. Uh, there were 219 programs in America during this period. Um, they use a regression-based risk adjustment uh, to control for the patient mix uh, so that they can sort of adjust these, these outcomes or at least show the statistical differences uh, where they exist. The red, the red centers were better than expected uh, given their you know, distribution of patient ages and, and, and comorbidities and so forth. The yellow centers were worse than expected. Uh, uh, you see that most centers were not statistically different because there's not enough data, you know, not enough N in the, in the statistical model to actually prove, uh, you know, statistically that they're, they're different. Uh, they just want, they're just what they are. You can see what they are. Does, does the fact that we can't statistically prove that you're, that, you're, that you're different, does that mean that we shouldn't measure? This is what, this is what a lot of people would seem to believe, you know. It's not a double-blind clinical study with statistical power. Don't do it. Wrong. Every organization that's any good measures everything that's relevant and learns as much as they can for it, recognizing that they don't have, in some cases, statistical proof. So they've got to they've take that information uh, with that understanding. But by measuring, we get powerful insight. What I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you the most recent data set available for the same condition. And here's what you get for measuring. You get dramatic improvement. You get compression of quality differences across providers. Why? Because they have a way to learn. They know where they stand. They know who's doing better. They know who to talk to. And the diffusion of clinical practice accelerates. And I've, I can show you hundreds of these pictures. Every time I've seen systematic measurement of outcomes, even if it's imperfect, even if we don't have huge statistical uh, you know, weight, things get better. Things get better. Okay? So we've got to measure outcomes. We also have to start measuring costs. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a topic in and of itself. Uh, we have to learn to measure the actual resources involved in the care of a particular patient going through the care cycle for a medical condition. That's the relevant cost. To do that, we have to map our processes of care and understand what resources we're actually using for that patient. Space, clinicians, facilities, equipment, and how much capacity that particular kind of patient is taking up of that resource as that patient goes through the care process. This is called activity-based costing. Uh, you tell one of your business friends, oh, I was talking, I was having a session today on activity-based cost. <coughs> and your business friends will be very impressed that you've heard of activity-based cost. But it's very powerful because it just gives you a way of understanding what are the resources we're actually using, how efficiently are we using those resources, could we use them better, do we really need this process, uh, could we use a different kind of a person to perform this function, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, et cetera. And what we find, and there's a slide in here on this, is there's just huge opportunities to, to be more efficient without sacrificing anything in terms of outcomes. Uh, because there's just there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. You can meet all your budget targets simply thinking like this. I, I guarantee you. Because we've done enough pilots and worked in enough provider organizations and we've seen the, 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 the size of the savings that are possible uh, 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 over and over again. But again, measurement is a journey. It takes time, it takes energy. You have to be committed to it. You, have, you, can't, you can't be afraid of it. You have to say, my God, let's measure. This is great. In terms of pricing, the, the, the idea of having a package price, I think is intuitively pretty clear. Uh, it's a little bit hard to implement, though, in a system where we're not organized this way. The way we're organized makes it awfully easy to think that you should pay for each department's office visit or procedure. Uh, but what we really don't want to pay that way, we really want to pay for the bundle. In order to do that, we have to understand the whole cost. We don't, we don't have that data today. Uh, this is happening now in, in increasing <coughs> frequency around the world. Uh, this is an example from Stockholm. It's uh, hip and knee replacement. Uh, all of which are being paid for now in, in relatively simple and uncomplicated cases with a bundle. Um, and you can see what's included in the bundle, and, and there's some statistics here that, that you can look at when you, uh, at your leisure. Uh, uh, let me, what, what have we learned from this uh, example in, in Stockholm, which, which we work very closely uh, with the county uh, on, this, on, this, on this case? First of all, there's been three or 4,000 hip replacements and knee replacements done under a bundle pricing model for the last three years. Nothing bad happened. The world didn't end. There hasn't been a revolt. Nobody went bankrupt. Everybody had much better incentives. Second thing that happened was care got a lot better and more efficient. Uh, one of the things you see in a good bundle price is what we call care guarantees. That is, the provider gets paid for this joint replacement, but if there's a reoperation within two years on the same joint, then the provider is responsible for doing that. And that was already covered. And the same thing is true with infections. And so this, this bundle pricing model had led to some very simple changes in the Swedish providers to actually minimize these complications. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that happens, because you're motivated to do that. Uh, and it's very simple, of course, just to get one check and, and, and that's it. And you don't have to figure out all the services and go for each one and pass paper back and forth and, and, and do all the accounting. Uh, and uh, 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 th this is, I think, increasingly going to be the way we start thinking about DRGs. And, and payment all around the world. Uh, we, we, we have a ways to go here in the UK, but I think we'll, we'll get there. Uh, again, time is very short. To integrate care across facilities, we just have to think about a number of questions. You know, what services should this facility try to deliver where it can be excellent? And, and the answer is, uh, you know, not all of them. Uh, and we have to make deliberate choices about, gee, what do we want to do and what do we not want to do? What should we refer out elsewhere to, a, to an affiliated organization or to somebody else? Uh, and then, you know, let's avoid doing the same thing in multiple locations that are pretty close to each other. I understand we're, we're short of time. I got that. <laughs> uh, let's get the right service in the right facility. Let's not replace the ear tubes for kids in tertiary hospitals. You know, let's all do all the ear tubes in an outpatient surgery center setting or something like that. This is something that Children's Hospital of Philadelphia did. The CEO had to eat it that there would be no more ear tubes in the mother church of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. That it was silly to be using massive resources to do this relatively simple thing that could be done very easily in a very low cost facility. And finally, we need to learn how to migrate those patients across those facilities. Excellent providers should start affiliating and partnering with organizations across geography to really manage 
uh, that the care for particular problems where, where, where they are truly excellent. This is an example of the Cleveland Clinic that's now managing cardiac uh, surgery of various types for various problems in multiple community hospitals across the entire eastern United States. They don't just provide hard, hard care in, in <coughs> Cleveland. They are actually employing the surgeons and, 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 and managing the care in a variety of, uh, of, of geographies and serving patients at the level of Cleveland Clinic quality much more broadly than just in one facility. Uh, and we, we've kind of been hung up on this local model. You serve the local community. Uh, this is starting to break down. It should break down uh, in, in the UK. And the IT platform uh, you, 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 can, you can read about. Value comes from uh, kind of driving these six agendas they start to reinforce each other. The more you organize multidisciplinary care around the patient's problem, the easier it starts to be to actually measure the outcomes. Uh, the more data you have on costs and outcomes, the more, the, the more feasible it is to start ask, uh, paying uh, through a package price rather than individual fee-for-services, uh, and so on. If we can start down the agenda, if we can start down this path, what we find is it gets easier over time. It starts to reinforce itself over time. And the challenge we have, I think, in the UK is how do we get the kind of value agenda moving? As I said earlier, it's happening. We've got some great examples, and we're going to hear about those uh, in a minute, but first we're going to hear from Tom Lee about kind of uh, how this uh, can be put into practice uh, really from his considerable experience. So hopefully that starts you with this kind of a holistic view of this. This is kind of a strategy problem. You have to see this as a whole. Now uh, over the course of the day, hopefully we'll dig more deeply into how do you actually do it. Okay? Thank you.